You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. I am astounded by the way that the Sharks have circled and the dog pile has begun on the play-by-play voice for television for the Chicago White Sox, John Schriffin this week. What is going on with that? I know that he gave a really exciting call on one of the few wins that this team has had this year. And he got a little overexcited, and right before he said his south side stand-up, he said, for all the haters, and immediately everybody said, is he talking about White Sox fans? And look, I'm with you. He, he doesn't have the street cred to say that about Sox fans. I don't think that's what he meant to do. But then what's unfolded over the week, and the way that media people, who should know better, honest to goodness, you know, I, I bring it up from time to time, it's not to brag, But I spent nearly a decade doing morning radio on rock radio around the country. Ed was involved in terrestrial radio for years. He was a program director at one point. We understand the ins and outs of the industry. We're not just a couple of guys sitting in a bar who've never done it before. Like, I actually have had it commented to me. In fact, Brooks Boyer said it to me years ago. That the difference between us on this show and everybody else is that we're not trying to use the show to get on the radio. And we're not really concerned about what anybody thinks about us because we already did it. Right. We've been there. We've done that. We've rejected that industry because we found most of the people in it lacking, just lacking. And then, (laughs) and then here we are. We we moved on to other careers, but we do this. We do this out of passion, out of fun, out of, out of everything else. Right. So I mean, like, so we're not interested. So we don't care if we tick somebody off. We don't care if you don't like us. We don't care if the team gets mad at us. And it's like a unique thing. And he even admitted that to me face-to-face at a Sox Fest years ago when we bumped into each other, okay? And it's one of the rare conversations I've had with him, right? But, like, he even admitted it to me when we were talking that that's the difference. So, like, we have an idea of what this is like. And to watch a bunch of media people pile on the new guy who just got in here. And I think what people need to understand is Chicago's one of the few, if, if not only, because I've never known a market other than this that is a unionized market. And that's the reason why when somebody's in last place, I mean, I'm going to pick on him. I'm not meaning to pick on him. He's just the example I give all the time. Remember Johnny B, right? Yep. Johnny B would come in last place after a couple of books and get fired. And lo and behold, Johnny B would find another job with somebody else, right? You see guys move from one station to another station, but you very rarely see a guy come in from another market who doesn't have a Chicago connection who hasn't gone and gotten his union card that makes it into Chicago media. It is a rarity for that to happen. Now, since Jerry Reinsdorf gets to make the call, really, on who's going to be on his radio stations, from what I understand, after talking to different executives, I've talked to people at other stations besides the one they're currently on, okay, generally the Sox have an enormous amount of input as to who they want to have cover their games and do play-by-play. They have a lot of control over it. But generally, if you're in Chicago media, you're part of a club, you're part of a union, and there's a recycling of person to person when they do things. And it's not a criticism. It's just an understanding that is a tight knit group. It is, it is people that go and they enjoy a softball league every year where they play against each other. They go out for drinks with each other, even if they're on competing stations. They hang around each other. You and I both know guys. They probably worked with each other at some point, at some right. station, somewhere, because it, it just, it's movement within the market. Yeah. I mean, when they're mad at each other, it's because it's personal because they've known each other for years. When they, when, when they are in competition with each other, it's friendly competition in a lot of ways, right? There's not a lot of out-of-market people walking in. Like, when I would get hired, I would come into a new town and I wanted to murder everybody on the air. Like I wanted to be number one right away and I had no loyalty to anyone. I would go in like I always try to like when I try to compare it to people, I'd be like, look, I'm not Howard Stern. But in the Howard Stern movie, when he would show up and do the things where he would call up his competitor and and, and wait on hold to make fun of the guy's show, I would do that. Right. I, I came in with the intention of being number one and taking your spot. Right. Chicago's not like that. That's why guys like remember when Mankow Muller came in the 90s, 
he overturned everybody because he was a guy who came in and wasn't part of the group. And a lot of them didn't like him. And then he came in and he just basically just laid waste to whoever he could lay waste with. A lot of people don't like him for it. But that was like something that actually happened. So it's a very different radio market. So to watch a guy from New York who's not part of the club come in and have a couple of missteps and to see them all jumping on him is so telling. And and the thing that's really gotten to me is first, you can see there was a Sun-Times article that came out this week where it was noted in the article that all these different media outlets asked John Schriffen to come on and talk in interviews about what he meant about the hater thing. And you know what he did? He said no. He only talked to MLB.com. He only, he only did that. And there's, and there's a slight thrown into the article, okay, where it's essentially like, well, you know, and th- that, of course, is like a Major League Baseball-affiliated thing and everything else like that. Why didn't he go and talk to all the talk shows in Chicago? And trust me, folks, as somebody who was a pompous radio person at times. You? Pompous? No. Exactly. And sometimes can be a pompous podcaster from time to time. Okay. (laughs) No. Okay. They're pissed that he told them no. Yeah. That's the one thing you don't do is you don't. Yeah. You you don't say no. No, you don't say no. You should be honored. They asked you to come on their live radio show. And trust me, they need the content. It's live. They got to fill content time. That's why you get these stupid things where like they they try to sit there and talk about their personal lives and have stupid game shows and all that stuff because they got to fill the hour somewhere. We've we've been there. We have literally sat there and been and, and with an hour left to go in a show, looked at each other and went, what do we do what? now? <laughs> I, I'm out of ideas. <laughs> right. Like Ed and I can actually pick out on radio shows because I know he can do it because he was a program director and I can do it too. We can pick out when they've run out of ideas because they go to old time standards from 40 years ago, or they start reading off of what we call a prep sheet in the industry where they subscribe to things where different ideas, topics, games, all these things are pre-written out by comedy writers and alleged the, comedy writers, right, alleged like bad comedy writers. And they send out these sheets and, the, and there's agreements with radio stations and either barter or money or anything else like that. Right. So you, we can always tell when they're out of content. So trust me, they don't like the fact that he wouldn't come on the show. And now you got on Parkinson Spiegel. You got Matt Spiegel ripping him, ripping John Schriffen for mispronouncing Vec. Which, which isn't, I mean, look, I understand that's something that you could sit there and say, well, how do you, how do you not, how do you take the Sox announcer job and not have a sense of their history? And Bill Vec is an important part of that. But right. still, in the moment, mispronouncing that, you're looking at it, whatever you're, you're doing, because, you know, again, while you're doing live broadcast, uh, a real live broadcast with a game going on, there's a lot of things going on. There's guys in your ear. There's a lot to, to do. He made a mistake. Oh, well, here's, here's the things about the mistake. First off, everybody's done it. If you're out of market and you move to a different part of the country, you're not going to know certain names. I went to Reno, Nevada doing morning radio, and I didn't know how to say San Joaquin Valley, or maybe that was Bakersfield. There were a lot of stops on the West Coast, and the West Coast says things very differently. There's a lot of different pronunciations. We talk different. I know we all think that we don't have an accent. Everybody else can tell I'm from the South Side when I'm on the South, when I'm on the the West Coast or the East Coast doing radio. I don't have nearly the <laughs> accents you do, but honestly, when I was on the East Coast, everybody listened to me. They're like, "You talk just like the Blues Brothers," right. I'm like, but I don't. <laughs> I got I, told, I don't. I got told that I was right out of Goodfellas by some hillbilly in West Virginia one time. So I thought that was kind of funny because that's completely the wrong city. I know, but I still thought it was funny. So yeah. uh, like I was compared to Joe Pesci when I got angry. So Southside, you're Southside <laughs> Catholic guy, not, you know. <laughs> right, right. So anyway, so anyway, I would instead of saying San Joaquin Valley would say San Joaquin. And I did it a couple times. I did. I did. I got a broadcasting degree and man in the heat and of it, in the heat yep. of it, doing a live read where I'm just looking at this thing, trying to go through and it's not phonetically spelled. I screwed it up. Now, now here's the difference. After I did it, somebody corrected me. After I did it, somebody said, you're not saying it right. Let me help you. You're not from here. The thing where Schriffen says, Bill Veek, that sounded pre-produced to me. That sounded like something a producer listened to and put together so it would run. It did not sound live to me. Now, maybe it was. If it wasn't live, it's not his fault. It's the fault of the people surrounding him that should be taking care of him. And that's a whole other story. That would explain an awful lot. Like when he gets really excited when Aloya Menez hits a home run and when he's done, Steve Stone gives him a hard time for being too excited, right? Like maybe... Which again, why are you doing that? <laughs> I know, but maybe... It's, like here's a guy who's shown up in a new place 
doing a new sport, really, who's trying his absolute hardest. When, whenever a newcomer comes in, I'm just like the rest of you. I'm like, who's this guy? Who's this guy? I'm like, I'm like when you open up the paste picante sauce and you're like, this stuff's made in New York City or actually New it's not York paste. City. It's the other yeah. guy. Get yeah, a rope. Well, paste is the one. Yeah, it's, it's the not right. paste one. That was the, the paste. Not the paste one. one. Not yeah. the paste one. But, but like, I, I'm with you on that, right? We don't like outsiders. We don't like anybody who's a Cub fan talking about White Sox stuff. We, we got a lot of things that we're there, like these unwritten rules. Like I, we all say we don't like unwritten rules, but we have our own. But what I see is a guy who came in and maybe he's a little over exuberant. Maybe he's a little too excited. Maybe he's trying to understand the game. You know, Stone reminded him the other day there's 162 games and that home run came in the first inning and there's a lot of ball game left. Like maybe you need to calm down a little bit. And I get it. And it might be some lighthearted jabbing, but somebody should be helping him a little bit. People used to write the things that I didn't understand because I wasn't from here. They used to write them phonetically. And to be honest with you, I'm sorry. It's not to get into a big fight with Parkins and Spiegel, but Matt Spiegel, you should know that. Okay. You should know just as much as you should know that your lucky Danny Parkins runs the ship because some of us are hosts and some of us are co-hosts. Right, Ed? Wait, what? Yeah. Some of us are hosts and some of us are co-hosts. And for him to dive all over him because he mispronounced a name and going on a rant, I think to me, it's dogpiling. It's picking on the new kid. It's, 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 the, it's the club being angry that he's not part of the club and he's not engaging you and going on an apology tour because he got excited about something and it was misunderstood. And I don't even know John Schriffen. I've invited him on the show. He hasn't come on yet. But you know what the difference is? I'm not angry at him because he doesn't want to come on my show. In fact, I probably understand why he won't come on my show because I make fun of the mothership and he works for the mothership. For exterior windows, doors, patio doors, and storm doors, look no further than Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest, where there's no high-pressure sales. They're not in your living room. You're over in their showroom, and you're seeing full examples, all the bells and whistles. You're not looking in a magazine. You're not looking at a dingy example window. The owners are in showroom, and they're on site as well. They use their own installers. They don't farm out the work. They've been doing it this way in Oak Forest since 1985 with all major brands, custom made, no stock items for a perfect fit. Visit Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest, a half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280 159th Street. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. You know, to your point about some people are hosts, some people are co-hosts, um... It's true. And, you know, as somebody who has made a career out of, I was never the guy, okay, in the booth. I also then bore the responsibility when I was doing jobs as a producer, when I was doing jobs writing copy in a production department, am I writing the ads and things like that, that I would have to make sure that what I wrote out made sense for the person that was reading it. If it wasn't going to be me, because it wasn't always going to be me, then that's my gig. That's my job. So whoever fed John that copy and didn't explain to him how to pronounce VEC just assumed he either knew or if it was pre-produced, committed the cardinal sin of listening to it and letting it go on the air. That means that not just John, but also then the producer or whoever, whoever is finalizing that product and putting it on also didn't know how to pronounce that. And remember, remember, Ed, people don't probably realize this. When you produce something, you listen to it multiple times. You oh, listen yeah. to it. You listen to it live. You listen to it the first time you go through it. Maybe you're checking some of the levels. You listen to it again because you're looking for some clicks. You, you, you're you adding music in the background. You don't just hear it once and it slipped by. So if it was no. pre-produced, I don't put any of it on, on, on the guy who was saying it. I put it on the guy who produced it. If it was live, then you know what? Start putting the, the pronunciations in the reads because that's what professionals do. Exactly. And, and we shouldn't be sitting here telling telling the, the radio club in Chicago how to act like professionals because that's what we're supposed to not be. And and yet here we are. But yeah, I, I, this half hour show that you're listening to, depending on, it, it doesn't matter really whether Chris produces it or I produce it because we, we I, I do produce the show on occasion. But I, I know for a fact that it doesn't take me, you know, if this is a 33 minute episode, it doesn't take me 33 minutes to produce the show and put it out. Because I do have to listen to it. I do have to make sure you have mispronounced things from time to time when I've been producing the show. And I've had to go back and find, 
you know, figure out a way to make it work. And I've mispronounced things or, you know, something comes through that's that's bad. So it, it, to, to kind of sit there and pile on this guy is is not only disingenuous because he is just the guy with the microphone. He is the, the guy that's on camera. That's his job. There are supposed to be people in place making this guy's life a little bit easier to allow him to handle the multiple things going on. And frankly, you know, I get Steve Stone has that really dry, sarcastic sense of humor. So he may have just been giving him a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a Steve Stone nudge there, you know, and and just trying to, to, to have a little fun with him. But to the extent that people are taking it to heart, like, you know, this guy is getting way too excited about an Aloy Jimenez home run. Honestly, I'm excited anytime the White Sox score a run right now because it's it's so rare. It'd be like me winning the lottery, right? Right. A, an Andrew Benintendi walk off. Honestly, <laughs> it's like the winning the World are, Series. It's, it's, it's like, like winning. winning the World Series. It, <laughs> the odds. Honestly, it, it, seriously, if you had gone to Vegas and bet that walk off cost you five million dollars, I just want yeah. you to know that. <laughs> yeah, if you had gone to Vegas to bet an Andrew Benintendi walk off on any any of the 162 games. You know, the odds are probably right up there with the White Sox winning the World Series or you going and grabbing a scratch off and winning 50 grand. OK, I mean, it's just you don't you don't need to pile on the guy. And honestly, this all comes back to this guy is only here because the guy whose lifelong dream it was to be the White Sox play by play guy got so annoyed with being here that he decided to go and be the announcer of the Detroit Tigers. So. You're ripping on the new guy who is replacing the guy that got so annoyed with this whole situation that he gave up his dream job to go and live in Detroit. And this is why we can't have nice things. This is why we can't have nice things, White Sox fans. This, yeah, this, because, is, this is why, okay? And, and, and finally, let's just put a little bow on this. If we weren't losing, if the manager wasn't terrible, <laughs> if, if you didn't feel so frustrated as a fan, you probably wouldn't be dogpiling on the guy like as fans like I, I look I know why he's getting dog piled on by the by supposedly fellow media people okay because he won't go do interviews and he's right now like you know he he's doesn't under, the outside he doesn't understand the, the boys club I believe that is and I say boys club there's girls involved in it too he's he's just not part of the club okay and that's that's unfortunate but I I just it smacks of that to me when I watch what happened this week with the announcer who, unless he comes out and says, yeah, I was talking about White Sox fans, I ain't got a problem with. I, I really don't. Now, on another note, the brand new mural on the wall outside of Cork and Kerry at the park at 33rd and Princeton looks spectacular. I'm going to go see it in person next weekend. Come on out. We'll hang out. I'll buy you a beer. Maybe I'll get Ed to come out, too. It's my birthday weekend. I'm spending it at the ballpark. Cork and Carry at the Park, the official sponsor of the podcast for fans, by fans, socks in the basement. See more at corkandcarry.com. And now, the Sox Nerd. Puts all those great tidbits up on the scoreboard at the rate, and he is the Sox nerd, and he's brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure? Visit the Village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore, and check out the Quarry Man Challenge happening next weekend. A great feature on the next episode of Southside Pod, also on the network that's coming out next week. And see more, learn how you can sign up at lamontdowntown.com. Nerd, what do you got for me? Chris, to mark a rare meeting and to keep myself distracted from the standings, here are some nuggets on the White Sox and St. Louis Cardinals. Sox icon and Hall of Famer Minnie Minoso played his only National League games with the Cardinals. After his second stint with the Sox, Minnie played 39 games for the 1962 Cardinals. He then closed out his career with a stint in Washington and three more stops with the Sox. The only three players to represent the Sox and Cardinals at an all-star game are pitchers Jerry Staley and Lance Lynn and should be Hall of Famer Dick Allen. Two years before joining the Sox, Allen played his only year in St. Louis and was the National League's all-star starter at first base. I love the St. Louis radio team of John Rooney and Ricky Horton, who both have strong connections to the Sox and each other. 
Rooney called Sox games from 1988 to 2005. His first game was opening day 1988 when the Sox starter and winner was Ricky Horton. Rooney's final call on Sox radio was the World Series winner in 2005. He then joined the Cardinals broadcast team, which included Horton. Cardinals legend Albert Pujols came to bat 13,041 times in what will be a Hall of Fame career. He only had one sack bunt in those plate appearances, and it came against the White Sox. On June 16, 2001, in his 67th Major League game, Pujols bunted off Sean Lowe in the seventh inning of the Cardinals' 8-3 win in St. Louis. The strategy, ordered by Cards manager Tony La Russa, worked as it led to an insurance run. The Sox have been infrequent trading partners with the Cardinals, but one swap they made really turned out well. On February 9, 1988, the Sox sent pitcher Jose De Leon to the Cardinals for Horton and Lance Johnson, who developed into arguably the greatest center fielder in Sox history. The deal also salvaged the De Leon for Bobby Bonilla trade the Sox had inexplicably made during the 1986 season. Five Hall of Famers have played for both teams. They are Jim Cott, Hoyt Wilhelm, Minoso, Clark Griffith, and Steve Carlton. Before I get to my zinger, I remind you, Pearls like these can be found on my blog, which can be accessed at SocksInTheBasement.com. My zinger, Robbie Grossman DH'd out of the leadoff spot on Wednesday, which is kind of an unusual place for the DH. He collected two doubles. Grossman, Pat Kelly, and Darren Erstadt are the only leadoff DHs with multiple double games in Sox history. Kelly was the most frequently used Sox leadoff designated hitter with 89 games, but the best Sox player here is Juan Pierre. The textbook definition of a slap hitter slash 353, 393, and 373 in 12 games as the Sox lead off DH. He hit safely in 11 of those games and had multiple hits in six. Sad fact, Wednesday marked the eighth game in a row the Sox had lost with their DH batting first. That's it, Chris. More than you probably wanted to know about the Sox, the Cardinals, Ricky Horton and lead off DHs. If you are a small business owner, you know just how challenging things can get, but you're a natural born problem solver, so it's all good. Still, it doesn't hurt to have some good neighborly help. Like yourself, State Farm agents are also small business owners. This enables them to help you choose the right insurance coverage to fit your small business needs. So why not insure your small business with a fellow small business owner who also happens to be a good neighbor? Contact State Farm agent John Harrell, 708-481-4500. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Tommy Pham is proving my theory that this team... Once it gets rid of Aloy Jimenez and Juan Moncada with the buyouts for next year and sheds $40 million off and has some wiggle room. And trust me, Chris Getz, if you don't do that and you pick up those options and you pay those guys the ungodly amount of money. should be jettisoned into the same sun that we were planning on jettisoning Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams into. You become the worst general manager in Chicago baseball history. I'm going I'm to say that. You become the worst general manager in Chicago baseball history. So I'm going to assume you're not that and that you're going to move on from them. And we keep saying, okay, you've got guys that are basically from the, from the, you got the bottom of your lineup set up. You need four hitters that are going to bat somewhere in the top five or six spots. And Tommy Pham fits in there. If you find three more that are guys that are producers, that are professionals, that may not be perfect, but that you're going to be able to afford with that $40 million. And if you could figure out which young arms down there are going to make up your your rotation next year and whether or not you're bringing back somebody that's currently in there on the same amount of money, or let's say what you gave Clevenger is what you're going to give somebody else to come in and do something similar to when you're expecting from Clevenger and you, you figure it all out and you don't overwhelm Garrett Crochet, right? Although I, I wouldn't move into the bullpen. Like they suggested, I would just go to a thing where he pitches like once a week, like how they treated Grayson Rodriguez 
out in Baltimore last year is how Garrett Crochet right. should be treated. You don't make him a bullpen arm. You keep him stretched out. You give him extra days rest, and you have a rotation, and then like every Saturday he pitches or every eight, nine days he pitches if you really want to stretch him out because that's what they did with Grayson Rodriguez in Baltimore, and it seems to have worked out very well. Just have him pitch every Sunday when you drag out the 83 jerseys. Like what you're doing with Noah Schultz right now down in the minors. They do well, the too. same thing. You don't make him a bullpen guy, and I think Pedro said that because he doesn't know what's going on because he isn't that bright. And I don't think they tell him everything. Okay. But, but you can add guys like fam or of a hitting caliber better than what you have on this team with that money. And Tommy fam is the hope that that plan is actually feasible. And that's how I see, it. I see him as the hope of that plan being feasible. And I see Corey Lee as a definite starting catcher on this team. And a part of the team because he's been given an opportunity and he's doing well. And I hope they're handling him well all 162 games, Ed. Yeah, and that's really, you know, as we're going through this season, that's the, the type of stuff we're going to have to start looking for, right? Is is can you manage Garrett Crochet to take the glimpses of him being an upper echelon starter and get him into a position where he can do that going forward and and do the things that you you didn't necessarily get from Dylan Cease or any of your prior aces and and I'm not going to open up a can of worms about Dylan Cease I know he's doing better with San Diego and all that oh come on Dylan Cease doing as well as he is in San Diego is another reason why Ethan Katz I don't know why you're why here anymore. also okay. there's that <laughs> like, too like, I mean, like the guy left and remember our concern was maybe it peaked and I said maybe he hasn't peaked maybe it's the team he's surrounded with and the people in charge of him and he's he may win the Cy Young this year for, for the Padres, yeah. but yeah, no, and it's it's one of those where where you know can you manage Garrett Crochet, but turning him back into a bullpen arm doesn't do the guy any favors and doesn't set you up for anything in the future. Okay, that, that just doesn't doesn't help. We know what Garrett Crochet can do out of the bullpen because we've seen what Garrett Crochet can do out of the bullpen. Moving Michael Kopech to the bullpen was just okay. That's proof that Michael Kopech's game was better suited to being a closer than it was to being a starter. And you can see guys like Liam Hendricks in his career or Dennis Eckersley in his career or Mariano Rivera, who's the greatest closer of all time in some people's eyes. A a lot of, you know, failed starters turn out to be really great closers. So there's proof of concept there. But if you're going to try and make Garrett Crochet a starter, you got to give him more than the first month or so of the season to sort this out. So can you manage him? Right. And, And the other part of it is looking at Corey Lee. Okay, looking even at some of the veterans that they've brought in looking at some of the young guys, if they end up coming up and, and spending some time up here. Are there pieces that you can sit here and say that, yeah, I want to build around that going forward, or I want to at least carry it forward, if not build around? Because I don't think there's anything here to build on, okay? But you can certainly carry forward Corey Lee. You can certainly carry forward Luis Robert Jr., even though that's a guy that you, you might sit there and say you're tempted to build around. I think right now it's just a guy that you're carrying forward to see if he can stay healthy because that's been his problem. And then maximizing what you can get out of some of these guys. Look, I don't expect Tommy Pham to finish this year with the White Sox because I think somebody is going to come and offer Chris Getz something useful for him more than just the cash considerations that's been traded, which, by the way, it's like the cash considerations octuplets, if that's the name of a player, and they all got named Cash. Like, the, the mom should have been more, you know, what's the word? Uh, give him more variety for it. But all Chris Getz is doing is just supplementing campfire milkshakes with the guys he's trading right now. But I think Tommy Pham is a guy that brings back something that you might sit there and go, okay, this could fill a spot for next year. Or this could fill a spot two years down the road and, and bring you back something useful. So that's all you're doing, right? And in the meantime, you get to see a glimpse of like, okay, what happens if Chris Getz actually gets a guy who's not on his last legs, who is a professional baseball player, who is maybe not a superstar, maybe never really was a superstar. Tommy Pham is a known name, but he's not a guy that was ever like a huge star. Could you have some level of success with a team built around guys like Tommy Pham? Could you have nine Tommy Pham's in your lineup to a certain degree, like with all varying skill levels of, of what they do well and win some baseball games? Yeah, if you got the right pitching staff, you certainly can't. If they can all play the field, yeah, you certainly can. So that's what we're looking forward to, and that might be the way White Sox rosters are constructed going forward, where you're trying to home grow some stars. You're not necessarily looking to spend a lot of money to import them until Jerry sells it. Until Jerry's son, unfortunately, sells the team, because we know that we're all worried about that. But 
in the meantime, yeah, the Tommy Fam bump is real. And the other thing too is is that Tommy Fam coming in and going to the team that everybody considers to be the worst team in Major League Baseball right now, but coming in hot and playing like it matters also does rub off on the locker room, I think. Okay. And and it and I think there were some veterans on this team that were dead assing it after a while because they just decided they were giving up and Tommy Pham's sitting there going like, no, I'm playing for my career. I'm playing I, I didn't get signed in the offseason to a, a guaranteed deal. I'm here. I'm showing everybody I can still do it. What's wrong with you guys? Yeah, well, that that's because he's motivated for the same reason that I I, I pointed out last week. He's he's motivated by money. He's in the business of Tommy Pham. Money, and money, money for Tommy Pham. I love it. I want more guys that are in the business of themselves. All right, that that Absolutely. look at the idea that I need to do better at what I do. I have to I have to get better at my craft. I want to be. I want people that are unselfish. Like I watched Jose Abreu accept an option to the minor leagues after winning not just an, the minor leagues rookie ball he won an mvp and he accepted an option to the minor leagues because he was able to admit that he was over his head and he had things he had to work on so what is the reason why andrew vaughn is still in the major leagues what is the reason there there is no reason he's got three options and he has proven well enough that he is not able to do this right now he is a replacement level player at best. He's got well over 1,500 major league at bats. It's the organization's fault for rushing him along, but it's like now we just don't want to admit that not not this regime, the regime before screwed him up. Like you don't even have to take hard questions. Why'd you send him down? Well, we just don't think he was handled very well a couple of years ago, and there's probably a few things he needs to work out. Next question? Or or just even you you don't even have to to place the blame. Why are you sending him down? I don't know. Have you looked at him at plate lately? He looks lost. <laughs> have you seen? Have you seen a White Sox have you game? Watched him play. Like <laughs> you know, the guy. The guy needs. He needs to work on something. He needs to refine his approach. He needs to work on timing. Something is something is not going right, and he's not hitting his way out of it here. So you send him down to Charlotte, where the stakes are a little bit lower, where the pitchers are a little bit easier to handle, where sometimes you just gain some confidence because that fly ball that that fell short of the warning track in Chicago is well out of the park in Charlotte because that's what happens in AAA. It's just, you know, it, the ball flies everywhere you go. So th- that's why you send him down. Why is Dominic Fletcher down there? Dominic Fletcher's down there because, whatever, he needs to work on something. He needs to figure something out. He's not down there because you're so desperate to have, you know, a, a, an outfield starting without him and Robbie Grossman taking his place. No, he's down there because Dominic Fletcher's got talent and he needs to, to refine the mental aspect of it, or he needs to refine his mechanics or something to get himself back in a position to succeed at the major league level. This isn't this isn't hard to figure out. I just hope that it isn't a marketing reason. Like, oh, we got Vaughn on all this stuff. Like, he's part of our core. We can't send him down. But you're right. For the same reasons that Dominic Fletcher is working things out, Andrew Vaughn should be working things out. You know, because I can't spit on the sidewalk without running into somebody wearing an Andrew Vaughn jersey, for God's <laughs> sakes. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.